The book of Devarim is unique. It's written in a different style than all the other books. Moshe is talking to the people in second person. I'm talking to you. The, the Bible critics love it, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Author A, author B, author C, right, 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 right. But the book begins on page 939, chapter 1 in Devarim. These are the words that Moshe spoke to all of Israel. These are Moshe's words. And the Gemara asks a contradiction between the book of Vayikra and the book of Devarim. And the Gemara answers in Vayikra are the words of Hashem. And Devarim are the words of Moshe. So the Gemara itself says that these are the words of Moshe. But there's a problem with that. Because we all know one of the basic fundamental principles of our faith is that Hashem dictated the entire Torah to Moshe word for word, letter for letter. If anyone claims that Moshe wrote one word on his own, one letter on his own, he's denying the divinity of the Torah. Now, how can we say here, these are Moshe's words? And the proof of that, that Moshe had no choice, we find a number of proofs of that. Um, I once saw a book of Bible criticism. Of course, the Bible critics assume that the Torah was written by a, by a number of people, right? But it says in the introduction, let's take the Jewish view for a moment that Moses wrote the Bible. I can disprove it in one second, right? It says in the Bible, it says in the Bible, Moshe was the most humble man that ever lived. If he was the most humble man that ever lived, he never wrote it. He was the most humble man that ever lived. Must be he didn't write it. All right, all right. All right. Here? Brandon. All right. uh, we're talking about the divinity of the Torah, right? We, uh, we have a tradition that the entire Torah was dictated word for word, letter for letter by God to Moses. And yet, book Deuteronomy, page 939, starts off, these are the words of Moshe, right? And the rabbis say, these are Moshe's words, right, right? But we know that God dictated it word for word, letter for letter. Moshe could not have written it in his own. So I mentioned there's a book of Bible criticism. They write off, let's take the Jewish view that Moses wrote the Bible. I can disprove it in one minute. It says, Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. If he was the most humble man that ever lived, he'd never write. He was the most humble man that ever lived, right, right? Must be, he didn't write it, right? What's the fallacy with that argument? That's not the Jewish view. Moshe didn't write the Torah. God wrote the Torah. Moshe was just a secretary. Write, most humble man. I don't want to write it. Write it. Under protest. Under protest. He had no choice. He had to write it. Right, right. Is one allowed to marry their aunt, according to the Torah? No. And if you do, what's the child? Moms are a bastard, right? You know that Moshe's father married his aunt? It says in the Torah clearly, in the book of Shemos. Right, 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 right. right. Now, okay, with Moshe and Mamza, it was before the Torah was given, so he wasn't a Mamza. But if you were Moshe and you had a choice of what to write, would you advertise the fact that your father married his aunt? Does everybody have to know that? Right? Does everybody have to know that? Look on page, um, page 323, the book of Numbers, of Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, and 323, and it says that Amram took his aunt Yocheved as a wife and she bore him, Aaron and Moshe. So if you were Moshe and you had a choice of what to write, 323, 323. <laughs> Would you advertise the fact that his mother... Does everybody have to know that? His mother marries that, right? <laughs> you wouldn't write that. What about the last eight verses in the Torah? And Moshe died. Who wrote Moshe died? Moshe wrote died and he died. Who wrote that, right? right? So there's one opinion in the Talmud, it was Joshua. That's a little bit difficult, because that means that after Moshe wrote a Torah scroll for all the tribes, and one for the Holy of Holies, and he died, recall, Joshua, recall, I have to finish eight more verses. Okay, that's one opinion. Another opinion is very simple. God said, right, Moshe died. And he wrote, Moshe died. right, 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 right. <laughs> So, it was dictated word for word, letter for letter by God to Moshe. Sakaman says these are the words of Moshe. It's not the words of Moshe, it's the words of God, right, right? And the reason why it's not a contradiction is because these were the words of Moshe. These were lectures and talks that Moshe gave the people. But that's not what makes it Torah. You know, we find in the Torah many things. We find abbreviations, Rosh Tevot. We find gematrios, numerical values. We have hidden cones. You ever hear of the hidden cones of the Torah? All kinds of fantastic things we find hidden in the Torah. If you would have sat there and written down every word Moshe said, you would have the words of a holy prophet. But you would not have Torah. You would not find any codes. You would not find any gematrias. Right, 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 right. Hashem told Moshe, say these words again and write them down. And I'll tell you how to write them down. Word for word, letter for letter. Now it becomes Torah. It was Moshe's words. That, that's not what makes it Torah. What makes it Torah is the fact that God dictated word for word, letter for letter. You see that? Everybody see that? Okay. Now, the book of Deuteronomy has three parts. The first part is a history lesson, right? The people who were born in the desert did not witness the events. He's telling them the he's eyewitness event account of the, the revelation on Sinai, Parsha of Eschanan, right? We have the golden calf and the spies. He's telling them the history. Now, you know, when you go to school, there's always one topic where they give you an introduction. Why is this important to learn? It's not math. It's not English. It's not science. What is it? 
history. Because you could say, why do I have to look what happened a thousand years ago? Who cares, right? There was a Chinese emperor, and his belly was two meters wide, and he had ten wives, and his name was Shu Shengxing. Who cares? <laughs> why do I have to learn that? <laughs> so what did they tell you in school? What's the answer? History repeats itself, right? If you don't learn from history, and it's true, <laughs> they're making the same mistakes they made in the past over and over again. No problem. That's no question about it, right? But Jewish history is unique. A Martian would come from Mars and do a study of all human history except for the Jews. And based on that study, he would formulate principles, how nations rise and fall. The rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, Soviet Russia, right? And after formulating all those principles, he would now take the Jews. What would he find? They break every rule, right? Right, any natural cause and effect which have long ago disappeared, right, right? The famous British historian, his name was Arnold Toynbee. Ever hear Arnold Toynbee, right? See, Arnold Toynbee was a very big anti-Semite. You know why? Every time he tried to make some pattern in history, the Jews messed it up. Right? <laughs> I'll tell you a true story. This boy grew up in a conservative family. His father said, you know, you're 13, you have bar mitzvah, you have to learn your have Torah. Come on, Dad, you don't believe that stuff anyway. Let's have a birthday party, forget it. No, 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 no. Your brother did it, you got to do it. They bribed him, we'll take you to Disneyland, this present, that present. Okay, he learned the stuff. Torah comes to the shul. He didn't understand the world was going on. He was so turned off after that. He said, I'm going to marry a non-Jewish girl. She said, my son shouldn't have to have a bar mitzvah. Okay, right? <laughs> Years later, this guy finds himself in West Point. West Point is a mil- military of academy, military academy in America, right? To be officers. And they learn about wars. In West Point, they have a computer. You put into the computer all the givens of any battle, and it comes out with all the possible outcomes. Usually, one of the outcomes is the right one, either the side one or the other side one, right? right, right? They put the six-day war into the computer. None of the outcomes were that he's just going to win. None, right? So this guy noticed that they weren't mentioning a word about the Israeli wars. He didn't learn the word about not the war of independence, not the Yom Kippur war, not the six-day war, right? Not the Maccabees, not the Markovo, the Romans, right, right? So he asked his professor, free charge general, you know, why don't we learn about the Israeli wars? Cadet, see me after the class. Come to this room, close the door. Why do you embarrass me before they talk about I just your question. Don't you think we know about the Israeli wars? Who do you think finances them? We do, right, right? But according to our calculations, they should have lost every war, right, 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 right? Must be they have God on their side. Well, we don't learn about God in West Point, right? He said, this non-practicing Roman Catholic is telling me I should be proud of being Jewish. He put a keep on, hasn't taken it off yet. This is a true story, right, 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 right? Right? Jewish history is unique. So that's the first part of the book of Deuteronomy. The middle part of Deuteronomy is the end of the law-giving process. What does that mean? You know, Moshe was on the mountain th- 40 days and 40 nights, and God taught him the entire Torah. There's a very big misconception people have over this. They think it means he taught him the text of the five books. Let me ask a question. He already read the book. He saw the movie, right, right? Why did he hit the rock? Why did he send his wife? Didn't he know that he read the book already, right, right? No, he didn't read the book. We don't have the text of the five books till the end of the 40 years. Moshe, God taught Moshe at Sinai the 613 commandments, right? I always thought there was 10. I just found that 613 <laughs> yesterday. But, uh, six, uh, but he didn't teach it to them all at once. Throughout the 40 years, Hashem and Moshe Lemur. God spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to them and tell them. How many times did that in the Torah? Many times, right? Each mitzvah, one by one. Now it's sits, now it's filling, right? And in the book of Deuteronomy, the whole book takes place, by the way, five weeks before the death of Moshe. From Rosh Chodesh Shvat, the first day of Shvat, till Zayin Adam, when Moshe died, right? That's 36 days, right? 30 days in Shvat, and six days in that, that's Eile. Aleph, Lamed, Hey is Gematria, 36. Aleph is one, Lamed is 30, Hey is six, five, 36, right? So he's, he's cramming it in. In the middle part of Deuteronomy, laws and laws and laws. Some of these laws were already mentioned beforehand, such as kosher. That's why it's another name for Deuteronomy. It's Mishnah Torah, review of the Torah. Because we do have some mitzvahs that are repeated, right? But most of them are new. I think out of 100 new mitzvahs, like 80 of them are new, 20 of them are old, something like that. Probably case. So, so, so the, the thrust of the mitzvahs in the book of Deuteronomy is the mitzvahs that apply to those who are entering the land as opposed to those who were wandered in the desert. The laws of battle did not apply in the desert. The laws of kosher did not apply in the desert. The laws of kings, all these things didn't apply in the desert, so now they're teaching them, right? And the third part of Deuteronomy is the final farewell of Moshe to the people, telling them what's going to happen in the future, right? If they keep the Torah, if they don't keep the Torah, the we and the wo- the woe and the wheel of the Jewish people depends on one thing, keeping the Torah. And we don't see that on a personal level, because every, every time a person did a sin, they got punished. Every time they did a mistake, they'd be no free will. Free will, they'd be no free will. We have to be able to see. We have, it has to be wicked people have a good, and bad, good people have a bad, otherwise they'd be no free will. 
But if you look at Jewish history as a whole, there was the golden age of Solomon, where everybody was rich, right? Then they sinned, destruction. There was the golden age of Spain, right? Then they started assimilating, expulsion, right, right? If you see the pattern in general, when things go, Joe, when the Jews stop giving the Torah, then they, then they have punished. That's how it happens, right? The Jews in Germany, right? They had a theory. You know what is anti-Semitism? You know what is anti-Semitism? Because we stick out. We're different than the Goyim. We have beards and payers. We speak Yiddish. We don't go to their schools. We don't you know, marry their daughters. It will be just like the Goyim. We'll be clean-shaven and speak German and be doctors and lawyers, right, and marry their daughters, right, and speak. We'll be just like them. There'll be no more anti-Semitism. Brandon, were they right or were they wrong? A little bit wrong or very wrong? Very wrong. The Zionist movement also had a theory. They said, you know what is anti-Semitism? Because we stick out like a store of thumb. If we had our own country and our own police force and army and our language and our own criminals and prostitutes, that's what Herzl writes, right? There'd be no more anti-Semitism. Or they'd accept it just like everybody else, right? Were they right or were they wrong? wrong. Were they a little bit wrong or very wrong? Very wrong. <laughs> so we have a pattern, right? When everything's going... It's clean, it's clean. Uh, whenever, whenever things go well, right, so, we had, so that's the end of the book. In fact, we, uh, we even find a, 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 a prophecy of our generation in the end of the book of Deuteronomy. She has a very interesting. Turn to page... Parsha Zitzavim. Turn to page uh, 1091, chapter 30 in the book of Devarim, right? right? And the Torah predicts, Moshe predicts, this before it even happened, they were still in the desert, Right? When these events will happen to you, the blessing and the curse which God will give you, you return to your hearts among all the nations which God has scattered you there, and you return to Hashem and hear His voice as everything I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and all your soul. In the future, there's going to be a Baal Tshuva movement. Jews are going to come back to Torah. You have to appreciate the fact that our generation is unique, right? If you know anyone who remembers pre-World War II Europe, ask them a question. I've asked many people this question. Do you remember in your hometown, you know, in Europe before the war, were there any families in your hometown where the parents were not religious and the children were? You know what they'll tell you? Unheard of, right? right? The other way around happened all the time. The parents were religious, the children weren't, right? Oh, there were some Balchuvas. There were some, but they were very rare and far between. Every town had their Balchuvas. <laughs> very rare, right, right? right? But today we have many Balchuvas every, every, wherever you go. Who doesn't know a family in a family of right, right? In Jerusalem, it must be 30 years from beginners, right? For men, for women, English speaking, Spanish speaking, French, right, right? Hebrew. And then it says, and God will return you, right? Uh, you're returning and have mercy and gather you from all the nations which you scattered you there. You'll be scattered in the ends of heaven, said my Rebbe. What does it mean? A colony on the moon, right? The ends of heaven. From there, God will gather you and there. He'll take you and bring you to the land which you inherit. And it'll be good to you and it'll circumcise your hearts. Doesn't mean open heart surgery, right? It means take off the covering of your heart, right? The hearts of your servants and children to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, to live. And, would, and these Christians, so here he's predicting in the future the Jews are going to come back to Israel and we're going to do tshuva, right, right? That's our generation, right? So that's the, that's the overview of the book of Deuteronomy in general, right? Now we're going to focus in, in the, in the Parshish of Arim, he talks about different things, um, reviews the, the, the sin of the golden calf, uh, the golden sin of the spies, right? But we're going to start from Pasha's Eschanan on page 959, right? And I implored Hashem at that time, saying, Hashem, my God, you've begun to show your servant your greatness and your great and your strong hand. Who is God in heaven and earth that can do like your deeds and your greatness, right? You've just begun. Moshe was 120 years old. God taught him the entire Torah, right, right, right? And yet, it's only a beginning. You know, the more you learn, you always see it in science like that. The more they find new, 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 uh, new, um, Discoveries, they see they know so little, so much more, so much more, so much more, right, right, right. Rabbi Akiva was so great, right? They, uh, the, the, Moshe was jealous of him. They said, why did you give the Torah to him, right? And they asked him, how much did you get out of the Torah? Like a dog licks out of the ocean. That's how much I got from the Torah, right? But don't give up. You're not required to finish it all. You've got to do your, everybody can learn as much as they can. Uh, you've begun to show me your greatness, your strength. Who has got heaven and earth? Like, let me pass and see this good land, the other side of the Jordan, the good mountain, the Levanon. Levon means white, Levan, the mountain of God, the temple which makes our black sins white. And the rabbis say, why did Moshe want to go into the land so badly? Did he want to eat from the fruits of the land, right? Jaffa oranges, <laughs> mangoes, that's what it's all about, right? right? We actually say that in our, in our, in our uh, after blessing, right? It says, we gave us a wonderful land. Eat the fruits, right, right? right? So the says, oh, Moshe didn't need the fruits. Moshe wanted the, uh, the mitzvahs that can only be done in the land. But 
Eating the fruits of Israel is a very big thing, right? The Bach says that when we study Torah, the Shem Shemayim, the holiness permeated the land and went into the fruits, right? right? Holy, right? So we, we stopped studying the Shem Shemayim. We didn't make the brach on the Torah, so that stopped. All right. Um, and God was angry at me for your sake. He's, he's blaming it on them. Right? Was, you did. God, what was your sake? He, he said with a rock, right? Why, why is it their sake? Had you not complained with the spies, we would have gone straight into the land and we'd have built the base of Megiddo, and now it would have been destroyed, right, right? And you, because you claimed with the spies, you caused me to, uh, uh, Miriam died, and there was no water, and they hit the rock. It's a result of your sin. The chef didn't listen. He said, don't speak to me anymore about this matter. Uh, Ravloch, enough for you. The Gemara says that Moshe told the sons of Korach, Korach, Ravloch uh, and B'nai Levi, enough the sons of Levi. And God answered him, Ravloch, right? The Korach was the rebellion. You know, the rebellion, mutiny on the bounty, right? The Korach rebelled against Moshe. And they wanted to be Kohanim, right? And Moshe told them they were wrong. God made Aaron the Kohanim. But he says the words, Rav Luchem B'nei Nevi, enough for you. You have so much honor, you're a lady. You want to be Kohanim too? And it seems that was not the right thing to say. Because they were wrong for rebelling against Moshe, yes. But to want to be on a higher level, spiritual, spiritually, that's a wonderful thing, right, right, right? I want to come close to God. I want to want to. I want to want to come close to God, right, right? I'm not there yet, yet but I want to want to. Right? You always want to have a higher level, right, right? It's never enough. So Moshe told them, enough for you, but I love you, right, right? You shouldn't have said that. So God picked them back. You want to go into the answer Israel? Why do you want to go into the answer Israel? More spirituality. Rav Lechem, enough for you, right? Just like you told them enough, enough for you. Right, Rav Luch. Don't continue speaking, man. Go to the top of the mountain. Lift up your eyes. East, north, south, west. And see with your eyes. Moshe had the first guided tour of Israel. He saw the whole land of Israel as it was then. In the future generations, first temple, second temple, or Samaya studying Torah, everything, right? Um, Strengthen Joshua, he will take the people in. Chapter 4, and now Israel. Now, in the book of Devarim, the Jewish people are called Yisrael. All the other books, they call B'nai Yisrael, ch- children of Israel. What's the difference? Here's Rabbi Hirsch. B'nai Yisrael means every individual. B'nai Yisrael. Speak to you, you and you and you. You put on tzitzit, you put on tzitzit. Everybody's individual. Yisrael is the generic name. Jewish people as one claw, one individual, one, 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 one unit. Now Israel, listen to these laws and justice which I'm teaching you to do, to do them, to live and come and inherit the land which God is giving you. Over and over again, Moshe repeats in this parsha and the next parsha, the purpose of the land of Israel is to keep the mitzvahs. Do the mitzvahs in the land. Do the mitzvahs in the land, right, right? This is the main, main address. You should not subtract from what I tell you. Do not, and do not increase, do not subtract. Let's keep the most of the laws of God. So on page, bottom of 959, right? Uh, don't add on to the mitzvahs. The ritual committee of the synagogue decides we'll do this ritual or that ritual, right, right? That's, that's tekes, that ceremony, that ceremony, right, right? It's not a ceremony, it's not a ritual, right? Once you add on, you can subtract as well, right? Once you make it a man-made religion, right? Uh, like different branches of Judaism, a man-made religion, so it becomes a, it becomes, you can change, you can, you can add on and take off, right? right? <laughs> the, uh, the analogy they give was a man borrowed a becher. You know what a becher is? A silver kiddish cup from his friend. When he returned it, he returned him a little, little one with it. What happened? It gave birth. Okay. <laughs> a few weeks later, he borrowed, he borrowed again the kiddish cup. He gave him a little silver becher, right? It gave birth again, right, right? Third time, you also have this, here we go, this time. Can I borrow your silver candelabra? Sure, big silver candelabra. Week goes by, doesn't give it back. Two weeks, three bucks, what's going on? It died. I mean, how do you die? Huh? If it can give birth, it can die. Right? <laughs> if it can give birth, right? If you can add on, you can subtract as well. That one comes, one, one leads to the other. Man made religions are constantly changing. To keep them as well as I command you. Your eyes have seen what God did to Balpaor. All the men that went after Balpaor, that God wiped them out. And you who cling to the Lord your God, Chaim Kulchem Ayom. You're all living, all of you today. So the commentaries say there were philosophers in the olden days who said that it is not possible for a person to cling to God in this world when you're alive. Your body is in the way. When you die, then your soul can cling to God, not when you're alive. And the second school of thought said, even in this world, when you're alive, it's possible. But not everybody. Certain people have these very high souls, they're able to cling to God, but not every individual. And the third school says, even every individual can do it. But it takes years and years of work. It doesn't come automatically. If you work after years and words, you can work out it. And the Torah says they're all wrong. All three of them are wrong. You who cling to the Lord, you got Chayim when you're alive, not after death. Cool, have everyone, not just individuals. Hayom, today. Today you can cling to God and you just Take all the garbage out of your mind and focus, right, right? You can cling to God even today, everyone. 
Okay, we're dealing with a generation that was, uh, that was born in the desert, right, right, right? But you still had many that remembered before that as well. Don't forget that. See, I've taught you today laws and justice as, as God has commanded me to do them in the land, again, in the land, which you're coming to inherit there. You shall keep, that's negative, you shall do it in positive. That's your wisdom and understanding before the eyes of the nations that will hear all these laws and they'll say, a wise and understanding nation, this great nation, who's a nation that has God close to him like a Lord our God, although when the nations will learn from us who taught them the uh, Supreme Court system, who taught them about kindness, we taught them morals. We taught them ethics. We taught the world more than us. Right, right, right. A Roman soldier is about to enter a city to pillage, to rape, to murder, to loot. He said, hold on, buddy, one minute. I want to ask you one question. What right do you have, philosophically speaking, to go into that city to pillage, rape, and loot? If I know what he would say before he chopped your head off, what would he say? You know any Roman philosophy? Uh, no, I don't. Very simple. I'm stronger. <laughs> I'm stronger, right? Might makes right. And if might makes right, and you have the might, then right or wrong, you're always right. Right? Wrong. You remember Camelot? Camelot, right? If might makes right, then you have the might, then right or wrong, you're always right. <laughs> Who taught the world that might does not make right? Was it the Romans? Was it the Greeks? Was it the Persians? The Jews. We taught the world that right makes might, not might makes right. We taught the world morals and ethics, right? Be proud of being Jewish, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. We taught them. All men are created equal. We taught them the Jewish concept, right, right? They even give us credit once in a while, you know. The United Nations is not known to be very pro-Israel. Is that the understatement of the year? <laughs> you ever hear of the Isaiah Wall? In the United Nations, the wall called the Isaiah Wall. It's a quotation from the book of Isaiah. They will beat their swords into plowshares. No more war. Isaiah, our boys, our prophets. We taught the world more than us, right? So the Goyim, right, are going to say what a wise and understanding people have God close to them, right? Like all this torch I give you, verse 9. Be, guard yourself and guard yourself very much. Don't forget the matter that you saw with your eyes. Even, it should not go out of your hearts all the days of your life and tell your children. The day you stood before God in Chorif. Chorif is another name for Sinai. Don't forget the day you saw God in Sinai. And now Moshe is now going to give an eyewitness account of the revelation on Sinai. When God said to me, gather the nation, right? And I'll let them hear my words. In order they should learn to fear me all the days they're living on the earth and teach their sons. You have to learn to fear God. Uh, Brendan, you ever been on a roller coaster? Yeah. Do you have to learn how to be afraid or is it automatic? Oh, no. <laughs> automatic! Ah! <laughs> right, right, right. Go down a dark road. And, uh, <laughs> you know, years ago, when you wanted to go, when you wanted to have an adventure, right, the adrenaline flow, you go to a jungle in Africa, right, right? With the wild animals, the lions and tigers. Say, if you live in New York, just go on a subway, right, right, right? In a bad neighborhood, the adrenaline flow, right, 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 right. You don't have to learn how to fear, right, right? Well, go, you're just, you're just go down the Arab marketplace late, late at night, right, right? <laughs> Scared, right, right? <laughs> Told you the guy, says, he saw two policemen, he said, I see you guys, I feel confident. They said, we don't, we're scared, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, but all of a sudden, when it comes to God, we're not automatically afraid. Some crazy guy, you're about to drink a glass of water, some crazy guy from the insane asylum, boop, 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 I put poison in your glass. You don't believe him, he's out of his mind, right, right? Would you drink it? Probably not. You wouldn't take any chances, right, right? But... 3,000 years of Jewish tradition says, cheeseburgers, right? Uh, poison to your soul. Rabbi, you only convinced me 99%. <laughs> I'm still not 100%, I'm still not 100% right? No. Don't take a chance. You have to learn how to fear God. It doesn't go automatically. You have to learn how to fear God. You have to remind yourself, God is watching, God is watching, right? You have to learn how to fear God, right? And you came close to me, and you stood onto the mountain, and the mountain was burning with fire out to the heart of heavens, darkness and cloud, Right? The fire is still burning until today, right, right, right? My Rebbe gave an analogy, right? You know, a thermos can keep water hot for 24 hours, right? Imagine somebody would make, invent a thermos that would hold it hot, keep it hot for a week. Make a lot of money, right? A month, a year, right, right, right? Ten years, right, 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 right? The Torah is the thermos that keeps the fire of Sinai going for 3,000 years, all right? fire. And God spoke to you from the, I'm not telling you what I saw, what you saw from the fire. You heard a voice, you didn't see any picture, right? Only a voice. And God told you, his confident, he commanded you to do the ten sayings, ten sayings, ten commandments in English, ten sayings. And he wrote them on these two tablets, and God commanded me at that time to teach you laws and justice to do them. Again, where to do them? In the land which you're coming to inherit. Page 963. And you shall keep very much, guard yourselves that you didn't see any pictures on that day, right? Lest you destruct yourself, you become destructive and you make an idol, a picture, any symbol, right? Male or female, animals, right? Birds, right? Uh, any creepy creature, the, 
you know, the crocodile god, the monkey god, and he fish, right? And the, uh, the waters lets you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, and you'll go up after them, and you'll bow down to them, and you'll serve them, which God gave them to all the nations under the heaven. Not clear what that means exactly. He gave them, gave them for light, and give them to, honor, to, or to worship, or he gave them the, the option to worship if they want to. But you, God, has taken and he put you in the iron furnace of Egypt to be a great nation today. So, um, on page 963, verse 20, right, the iron furnace. Why is Egypt called the iron furnace? You know, when you have gold and it has imperfections in it, what do you do? You put it in this very high furnace, you smelt it. That means you burn away all the imperfections, and you're left with solid gold, pure gold, right, right? The slavery in Egypt burnt away our imperfections. It made us sensitive to the sufferings of others. Now, there are other people that also suffered. The blacks also suffered, right? But they're not as sensitive. At the, who's at the, at the front of every civil rights movement, right, right? For the blacks, for apartheid. The Jews, the Jews, right? Communism. <laughs> it's always Jews, right? We're sensitive. I'll give you an example of this. Um, during uh, the 70s, there was a guy in Cambodia named Pol Pot. You ever hear of Pol Pot? He was a dictator. He committed genocide. He, just, he, he was killing all of his own people. And they were running, they were, people were trying to escape him from Cambodia on these rickety boats. They were called the boat people, right? And nobody wanted to take him in. And Menachem Begin was prime minister of Israel at the time. He says, let him come to Israel. We'll take him in. We know how it feels like, right? right? You ever hear of The Voyage of the Damned? There was a book and a movie about this. In 1939, Hitler wanted to test the world's opinion about the Jews. So he allowed one boat of Jews to leave Hamburg. He was supposed to go to Cuba. But nobody wanted to let him in. The American Coast Guard wouldn't let him in. Cuba didn't want to let him in. Right, right. They didn't know what to do. Right, they would go back to Germany. Right, right. Hitler learned the lesson. Got, 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 the, got. The, he got the back the, the feedback. Right. The world doesn't care about the Jews. Right, right. Do whatever you want. All right. Finally, in the end, they, the, the skipper was going to scuttle the ship, so they have to rescue them. In the end, was Belgium, France, and England took them in. Those were Belgium, France. Later on, were captured by the Nazis. Right, right. Uh, so Begin said, we know what it feels like. Let him come to Israel. And many of them actually did. There's actually a Cambodian community here still today from then. Right, right, right. We are, that we are what's the word? I said, sensitive to suffering. Okay. To be a nation. And God was angry at me for your words. He swore that I should not cross the Jordan. On page 963, right? To the good land which God is giving you. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan. You will cross and enter the land, right? And guard yourself. He you forgot the covenant that God made with you. And make any idols which God commanded. He's a fire. He's a jealous God. This is what we read on, on Tisha B'Av, verse 25. When you have children, right away when you come in, everything's going to be great. But a few generations later, you have children and grandchildren, and you grow old in the land, and you'll be destructive. You'll deteriorate, and you'll make idols, and you'll do the bad in the eyes of God, make him angry. I testify to you, heaven and earth, you'll be lost quickly from on this land which you're coming to inherit. And this was fulfilled twice in our history. We were thrown out of the land two times. And you know, there's no guarantee we're here permanently today. We hope so. We pray so. There's no guarantee. Before the Six-Day War, you know, it looks like Israel's going to be wiped out again, right? They were all going to attack us. The, the Western world turned their backs, right, right, right? You tank, and the United Nations just took out their forces, right? The Prime Minister of Israel, he addressed the people before the Six-Day War, and he broke out in tears. He broke out in tears. It looked really bad, right, right? So we hope today, but there's no guarantee. You will live, not live long days. God will scatter you among the nations, right? And you'll be few in number among the nations. That God, how can anybody have known that, right? Every nation, we have few Jews, right? And we, the Jews that were scattered around the nation taught the world. See, we were supposed to teach the world by example. If we would live in Israel and keep the Torah, right, and be an example for the world, I mean, what would happen if in Israel today there was no crime? How would the world, no drugs? What would the world say? Wow, right, right, right? They learned a lesson from us, right? The first jail that was opened up in Israel, I think it stayed empty for about 12 years, right? There was no such thing as Jewish murderers, no such thing as Jewish rapists, no such thing as uh, thieves, maybe. <laughs> alcoholics? There were no Jewish alcoholics. Right? We used to give the kids wine at the Kiddush, right? Wine, like, like, uh, wine, we had a neighbor, we had a guest. Uh, he's a minor, I give him a minor, I give him wine. Right? It was never forbidden by the non-Jewish world. To you, 18, you can't touch it, you get drunk, right? right, right, right. Uh, Today, unfortunately, there are Jewish alcoholics, there are Jewish murderers. <laughs> unfortunately, today, uh, we learn from the non-Jews. We learn from the non-Jews, right, right, right? So we were supposed to be an example by being one nation that's unique, right? And because we didn't fulfill that goal, and we sinned, so we're scattered around the world. And everywhere Jews are, they have to plant these seeds of spirituality, which change the nations, and it has. We have taught them many things, right? We still have a long way to go. We're not finished yet, right, right? We, we have taught them, we have civilized the world in many ways, it's true. 
So you'll be scattered around the nations, you'll be a few in number wherever you are, right? And usually when you're few in number, you assimilate, right? You disappear. But you're not going to disappear. Like the Jews in Germany tried to disappear, and they didn't let them, right? When you forget, you're a Jew, they remind you you're a dirty Jew. I saw a picture of Jews going into the gas chambers, and they said under it, the only clean Jew, the only good Jew is a clean Jew. Right? Meaning, meaning, a dead Jew. <laughs> and you'll worship their man-made gods, wood and stone, which you don't, you don't, don't see, do not hear, do not speak, do not smell, right? Who were the nations who forcibly converted Jews? What, what religions forcibly converted Jews? Christianity and Islam. And what are their symbols? Wood and stone. The wood cross, the stone of Mecca, right, 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 right? And the codes is hinted over here, Mecca and Jesus. I mean, hinted in this verse, unbelievable. And you'll seek out from there Hashem, and you'll find Him, and you'll seek Him out with all your heart, no matter how far you fall, there's never all the way. You never fall out of God's hands. No matter how far you are, you will find Him with all your heart, with all your soul. When it'll be pain, you'll find all these things that happen at the end of the days, you'll return to Hashem and listen to His voice, because God is compassionate. He will not uh, forsake you, He will not destroy you. He will not forget His covenant with you, right? Remember, what did the Christians say? Right? This is a contradiction to Christian theology, right? You know, uh, Brendan, you ask a Catholic, how do you know you're right? What will he say? Because God chose the Jews and changed his mind and chose the Catholics. They were the chosen people. And what did the Protestants say? He chose the Jews and changed his mind and chose the Protestants, right? What did the Muslims say? He chose the Jews and changed his mind and chose the Muslims. And what do we say? He chose the Jews and didn't change his mind. Right, right, right. That's all. <laughs> That's basically the difference, right, right? They all agree we were the chosen people, right, right, right? See here it says. Here it says, um, he will not change his mind. He will not forget the covenant, right, right? I mean, the, God chose the Jews. He was a little bit wishy-washy, right? He couldn't decide, right, right? He chose the Jews. They were never any good anyway. Look at the Old Testament, how bad they were. They always sinned. They always made problems, right? So he chucked them out, and he took the Christians, because they're so much better than those low Jews. That's what it basically says in the New Testament, right, right, right? He will not forget his covenant with your ancestors. He swore to you. And now we have a very important verse, verse 33, 32. Go inquire for the early days that were before you, from the day God created man on the earth, one end of the heaven to the other end of the heaven, right? He's challenging the people. Study anthropology, archaeology, history, right, right? World history, comparative religions. From the day which God created man on the earth, from the beginning of history till now, from one end of the earth to the other, and the American Indians, the Eskimos, the Japanese, everybody, right, right? Has there ever been like this great matter, or has anything like it been heard? Does anybody make the claim that what? The Torah is predicting no one is going to ever make this claim. That what? That a nation heard God speak from the fire like you did and survived? Does anybody make the claim that God appeared to an entire nation and they survived? Do the Christians claim that God spoke to Jesus in front of a million people? No. Do the Muslims claim that God spoke to Muhammad in front of a million people? No. You can't get away with it. It didn't happen, right? right? And they survived. There was, there was one group called the Hare Krishnas in India. They do claim that God appeared to a large number of people. Only one catch. What happened? You know what happened? They all died, right? How come you never heard about it? We all died, right? That's why you never heard. How do you know about it? One of them survived and told me. Okay, right? So the question, or has God ever tried to take a nation from another nation with wonders, with signs, with, with war, with strong hand, outstretched arm, awesomeness, right? Like he did to you in Egypt before your eyes. All the, does anybody claim ten plagues in Egypt? You have been shown to know, not to have faith, to know that God is God. There's nothing besides him. We know there's a God, not have faith. See, here we have the Torah predicting no one is ever going to make this claim, and no one has ever made this claim. So how do we explain it? Very simply. You know how come never made the claim? You know why? Because you can't make such a claim if it didn't really happen. People claim the Holocaust never happened. Does anybody really believe it's possible that a person or a group of people can make up a lie on the scope of the Holocaust and get the world to believe it if it didn't really happen? Right, right, right? That's what we say. That's why we know it happened. We claim it, no one else claimed it, right? But someone who doesn't believe in the Torah has a very big problem in this verse. You know what the problem is, Adam? What's the problem? If you don't believe in the Torah, you have a problem with this verse. What's the problem? Someone did claim it. You know who claimed it? We did, right? The Jewish people claim that God spoke to an entire nation, right? And we got Jews, Muslims, and Christians. I believe that's the majority of the mankind, right? All the Muslims, all the Christians. At one time, all the Jews. Yeah, I'm not so sure. But at one time, all the Jews believed that God spoke in Sinai, right? right? So we made up such a lie. We got away with it, right? If so, how can we claim no one else is going to make that claim? I got away with a perfect crime. I stole a million dollars and got away with it. I'm going to say, no one else is ever going to make do that? How do you know? If you were smart enough to figure it out, maybe someone else figured it out too. Right, right, right? How do you know? How can you make such a claim? It's a very big problem for those who don't believe in the Torah. Here it says, no one is going to make that claim, and no one has made that claim, except for us. The answer is obvious, because it happened. You can't get away with it if it didn't happen. It did happen. It happened to us. We 
handed down the tradition from our parents, sharing parents to children all the way down. That's a, a, can you convince a Holocaust survivor the Holocaust never happened? Impossible. He was there. The son of a Holocaust survivor. The grandson. The great-grandson. Maybe a little bit easier, the great-grandson. But he'll say, my grandfather said his father was there. Right, right, right. Here we have the Jewish people witnessed it and handed it down. That's very powerful. Let's continue. Verse 35, you have shown to know, to know, not to have faith, to know that God is God, there's nothing besides him. That means there's no other God, there's no other God, there's no existence besides him. Our whole existence is the desire of God to be a world. God doesn't want a world, doesn't have to destroy it, he just doesn't want it, it's not there. From the heaven have you made us hear his voice to punish you. On the earth he's shown you his fire, and you heard his words from the fire. So it says clearly, black and white, we heard God speak in sign him. People have a misconception because they saw the movie and didn't read the book, right? If anybody saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, you ever seen the movie, Ten Commandments, right? It shows Moshe on the mountain getting the Ten, ten Commandments, and the people down below making the golden calf, right? It doesn't show the people get hearing the Torah, right? They, everybody saw the movie, didn't read the book, but it says clearly in the book, they all heard it, right? And because God loved your ancestors, and he chose their children afterwards, and he took you out with his great power from Egypt to inherit great nations before you, page 967, right? Uh, to bring you and give you this land, he, know today and put it to your heart. Hashem is God, heaven above earth, below there's nothing besides him. Know is with your mind, right? But you have to have both, right? Brendan, should you marry someone, right? Uh, first, it should, it, should, it should be good in your mind and in your heart, right? What should come first, the heart or the mind? Uh, in our mind first. Most people. Yeah, most people go with the heart. Right? And then yeah, the heart can take you anywhere. Then all of a sudden, where am I? What did I do? Right, right, right? They say, get married in haste. Regret and leisure, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, mind comes first, right? Know is your mind. And then put it into your heart, right? Well, you have, when you know it, you have to feel it. You have to put it inside, inside. Put it in, right? Put it into your heart, right? There's a word for it, I can't remember. Put it into your heart, right? God is God, heaven above, nothing. Guard and therefore keep his laws and admits which are commanding to you. It'll be good to you. God is giving you his commandments. Not because God's a sadist. Not because God wants you to suffer, right? Right? He wants me to suffer. I gotta keep all these laws. It's good for you, for your children afterwards. You should have long days on the land. Again, the land of Israel, which God's giving to inherit, right? Now we have a break in the middle of the parsha with the cities of refuge. We already had this before in the book of Bamidbar. If you murder someone unintentionally, you gotta run to these cities of refuge. You say, you know, I'm busy now, I got a project to do. I'll go later, my brain. I haven't got time to go now. There's a Avenger of the blood, the close relative of the deceased, he can kill you if you're not in the cities. You have to run, 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 run. There were signs all over Israel that said, Miklat, Miklat. What does Miklat mean? Um, shelter, shelter, you know, for, for cities, refuge, 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 right? There's also signs of Miklat, right? Uh, bomb shelters are called Miklat, right, 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 right. There were no signs saying Jerusalem. Did you know that? When the people went to, three times a year to the pilgrimage holidays, if they got lost, they would have to knock on the door, right? Uh, which way to Jerusalem? Oh, this way, that way? Oh, yeah, you need a place to spend the night? Have you had lunch here? All right. Uh, but run, running to the city of refuge, you're a murderer, don't come to my house, go ahead, signs. All right. So Moshe put three cities for refuge. Let's continue. Um, page, chapter 5, on page 969. Moshe called all of Israel and said to them, Hear Israel, the laws and justice which God I'm can't give you today. Teach them and learn them and do them. Because God had made a covenant with us as Horeb, not your ancestors, and he made this covenant with us, all of us here today, all life. He's referring to those who were still alive. Now, only the males from the age of 20 to 60 died in the desert, but women did not die. Women are people above that age, below that age, the tribe of Levi, right? Face to face, God spoke to you from the mountain, from the fire. I stood before Hashem, and between you at that time, to tell you the word of Hashem, if you were afraid of the fire, you did not go on the mountain saying. And here we have a review of the Ten Commandments. And it's a little bit different than it says in the first one. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. So we talked about this yesterday. We said, there cannot be a mitzvah to believe in God. Because if you don't believe in God, who's commanding you, right? And if you already believe in God, why do you need a command for you? You believe in him already, right? The Rambam says, I am the Lord your God is to know there's a God. See the design in the world and know there's a God. That's in your mind. Do not make other gods before me. Wherever you are, before me is anywhere, right? I'm everywhere, so you can't make any gods. Wherever you are, it's before me. Do not make an idol, a picture of heaven above, earth below, uh, the waters in the, in the, in the, under the earth. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them. I am a God, a jealous God, the sins of the fathers and the sons for three or four generations. Those who hate me, if, the, if they continue in the way of the, of the fathers. And does kindness for 2,000 generations. That's a ratio of 1 to 500. To those who love me and keep my commandments. So the first act, commandment is in your mind. Know there's a God. The second one is in your action. Don't do action. Don't make an idol. Now we come to speech. Do not take God's name in vain. He will not claim to see you. Take his name in vain. Remember Perry Mason, right? Brendan, put your hand on the Bible. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth. Hold the truth. Tell the truth. Sorry, help me, right? 
did you murder your wife? No, not me. <laughs> <laughs> did you invest a million dollars in your business? No, not me. Do you believe the guy? Do you believe the guy? But he put his hand on the Bible, right? <laughs> if you don't believe him anyway, why bother making him put his hand on the Bible? <laughs> right, right? <laughs> and you have to know, when this institution began, maybe um, 200 years ago in England, whenever it started, I don't know, even by the non-Jews, perjury was considered very, very severe. You would not put your hand on a Bible and lie. They were frightened. And the rabbi said, you know why? Because when God said the third commandment, the entire world trembled and the whole world heard it. They heard it. Don't take God's name in vain. So the first commandment is in your mind. Know there's a God. The second one is in your action. And the third is speech. How do you concretize knowing there's a God? Keep the Sabbath day holy as God commanded you. Six days shall you do your work, submit to make a living, support your family, do all your activity. The seventh day is Shabbos. Don't do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your servant, your maidservant, your ox, your animals. Can't make your animals work on Shabbos, right? You should rest. Because you remember, you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and God took you out. Therefore, he told you to command Shabbos. So in the book of Exodus, it says it a little differently. First, it says they remember the Sabbath day. And here it says keep the Sabbath day. And there it says the reason is because six days God created the world. Here it says because he went out of Egypt. Uh, so let's focus on that one minute. I understand why six days God created the world, right? That's why Shabbos. But what does Shabbos have to do with God of Egypt? What does the going out of Egypt have to do with Shabbos? Why should I keep Shabbos because God cooks out of Egypt? What does that have to do with that? What's one have to do with the other? And the answer is, when you're a slave, you can't keep Shabbos. When the master says, work, you better work, right, right? You have no choice in the matter, right, right? In order to keep Shabbos, you have to be free. You can't keep the holidays if, 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 if you're a slave, right, right, right? And there it says, remember the Shabbos day, which means positive. And here it says, shmor, negative. Which one did God say? Remember or, or, or keep? Shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad. He said the both simultaneously. What does that mean? There's two aspects of Shabbos. You have the positive aspect and the negative aspect. Right? Negative aspect, we all know. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. You can't write, right? You can't drive cars, you can't go swimming, you can't do this, you can't do that, right? A girl was in a college campus thinking about keeping shop. So if I keep shop, I'll feel like I'm in jail, can't do anything, right? When she finally built up the courage to do it, she said, I never felt so free before in my life. You know, we become slaves through our modern technology. It's four o'clock, gotta hear the news. But you hear the news at three o'clock, I gotta hear the news. Phone's ringing, gotta answer the phone, cell phone, right? right, right. My greatest pleasure Friday afternoon, I unplug my telephone. I'm not a slave to the phone. The phone is my slave, right, right, right? Imagine you, there's a place called Rockefeller Center in Manhattan. You ever to Rockefeller Center? They have a skating ring over there, right, right? Belongs to this millionaire Rockefeller. I heard it sold to the Japanese. I even heard the Japanese sold it already. Anyway, one day a year, Rockefeller Center is closed to the public. Why? Because if it's open every day, the law in New York is you lose your private ownership, right? I'm donating to the public. Don't forget, it belongs to Rockefeller. Similarly, the world belongs to Hashem. He lets us use it. One day a week, remember, it belongs to God. By not doing any act which shows God, man's mastery of the world. So work and Shabbos doesn't mean physical labor. There's two words in Hebrew. Avodah means physical labor. Evan is a slave. Melacha means creative activity. I can pick a table up all day long, Shabbos, take it up the stairs, I'm sweating, didn't break Shabbos. You take a handkerchief that weighs an ounce from a public domain to a private domain where there's no A-roof, you break the Shabbos, right? I'm the master of fire. Years ago, to make fire, to stick, rub two sticks together for an hour, that was work. Yeah, you just push a button, that's not work. I'm the master of fire, right? That's forbidden. So the negative aspect, give the world back that. What's the positive aspect? Why don't somebody sleep the entire Shabbos? I had girls at my house for Shabbos. Friday night after the meal, went straight to sleep till the morning meal, 11 o'clock. After the morning meal, went straight back to sleep till the third meal. They slept the entire Shabbos, right? right, right? You're supposed to leave it, right? So you, you didn't break it. You didn't keep it either. What are you supposed to do on Shabbos? Imagine you're lost in the woods. What do you do? Keep on going? Maybe you're going the wrong direction. Take out your map and your compass. Get your bearings. Where am I going? Think about what am I living for. If you don't know what you're living for, you know nothing. I don't care if you know how to get to the moon. My Rebbe calls it uh, 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 a scientist is a glorified plumber. The plumber knows how to fix the toilet. He knows how to get to the moon. Just information. Okay, so the scientist knows more information than the plumber. Just information, right, right? What are you living for? A car full of guys speeding down the highway, 100 miles an hour, 12 o'clock at night. And the, and, the, and the driver says, hey, where are we going? And the guy in the back says, shut up and keep on driving. That's how many people live their lives. Shut up and keep on driving. Never think where you're going, right, right? So Shabbos is the time to remember where we're going. Okay, that's a positive and negative. Honor your father and mother as I've commanded you. In order to have a long, long life, you should be good to you on the land, right? It's very difficult. Parents, they get older, right? It's hard to take care of them, right? You, live a lo- you want to live a long life? Now, this guy, decides he's, he's fed up with his father. He's going to lock him in a room and starve him to death, right? As he's sitting in the room, his little son's watching. What are you watching? I want to do it to you. Oh, oh no, I changed my mind. Forget it. No. <laughs> All right? Now, honor your parents seems to be between man and your fellow man. The first tablet is man and God. Don't uh, know this guy. The second tablet is between man. Shouldn't it be on the other tablet? Why is it on the first tablet? Should it be on the second tablet? Shouldn't it be? Right? 
The first tablet is man and God. No, there's a God. Keep the Shabbos. Don't think God's there. Second tablet is don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, right? Honor your parents should be on the second one. Why is it on the first one? Because that's the analogy. God gives us everything. He gives us air to breathe. He gives us clothes to breathe. We don't feel it so much. It's a little abstract. What your parents give you is concrete. If you don't honor your parents, there's no way you're going to honor God. Right? So honor your parents as a way of honoring God. It's between men and men. When the rabbi, when his mother came in, I'm standing up in honor of God's presence. Second tablet, do not murder. I don't think, it says do not kill. That's a bad translation. You have to kill sometimes. You have to kill in war. You have to self, kill in self-defense. You have to kill death penalty. Right, right? It means don't murder an innocent person. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Death penalty. Do not steal. It's talking about kidnapping people. You kidnap a Jew and sell them the death penalty. Right? These are all actions. Don't bear false witness. That's speech. And the last one is, do not covet the house of your, the wife of your friend, his house, his field, his servant, his maid servant, his ox, his donkey, anything which is his. Do not covet doesn't mean, oh, you got a nice tie. Where can I get one? You got a nice shirt. It means, I want yours. Right? I think you should sell your house. I want to buy it. Divorce your wife. I want to buy I want to marry her. Right? Is there any man-made law that says, do not covet? No. Can't, I hear prosecutors over covet. You know he's coveting. You know, right? you know he's coveting, right? It's in his heart, right? American Constitution doesn't say, do not covet, right? Right, there is one case. I want to buy your watch. You don't want to sell it. So I grab your watch. I throw you a $100 bill and run away. Did I steal? I throw you. I, said, I, I gave you money, but you didn't want it, right? I covered it. Right, 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 right. Right? So the question is, Rabbi Hirsch asks, why is it the first tablet, first it starts out with mine, no, there's a God. Then it comes to action. Don't make idols. And then comes speech. Don't take God's name in vain. Second tablet, it starts out with action. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Then comes speech. Don't take God's name. Don't bear false witness. And the last one is, don't covet in your heart. Why is it change the order? Says Rabbi Hirsch, when it comes to man and God, the most important thing is the mind. No, there's a God. Put filling on a monkey is meaningless, right, right, right? It's an action without a mind, right, right? Then comes mind, then comes action and, and speech. When it comes to your fellow man, the most important thing is the action. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't give, I don't care if you hate the guy's guts, but don't murder. Don't steal. Right, right, right? Not only that, don't do, say bear, bear speech, be a false witness. And not only that, don't even hate him in your heart. See? Starts, here it starts from heart, from mind. We say heart, we mean mind. When I say heart, by the way, when the Torah says heart, it doesn't mean, we think heart means emotions, right? Heart means emotions and mind, right? King, King, King Solomon says, from everything that you guard, guard your heart. What does he mean, Brandon? Guard your heart. It means guard your mind. Put a filter in front of your mind. Don't let all the garbage go in. You know, some places they brainwash you, right? In North, in North Samaic, we don't brainwash, we dry clean. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's so bad to brainwash. Sometimes the brain needs a little bit washing. It wouldn't hurt to wash the brain once in a while, right? right, right? <laughs> this guy was very open minded. He was so open minded, you know what happened? His brains fell out. <laughs> don't, don't be too open minded either. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right. all right. But the point is, when the Torah says heart, it doesn't mean only emotions. It means the, from everything you guard, guard your heart, it means guard your mind, right? right? So, first in your mind, know there's a God, then your actions, then your speech. And when it comes to your fellow man, the main thing is action. Don't murder, don't steal. And not only that, in your heart, don't, don't covet. I want to end with a midrash, a hypothetical case that from do not covet, one can come to break all Ten Commandments. Right? Do not covet, right? A guy coveted, his friend had a beautiful wife, a neighbor, and he coveted him. And there was a wall between his house and his friend's house. Friday night, his friend was out of town, his wife was alone, he breaks down the house, the wall breaks the shoppers. Rapes his friend's wife, commits adultery. Then he kidnaps her, steals. Right? Then he murders her, right? right? Then he hires witnesses to say false witness. Then he comes to court and he steals falsely. His parents tell him off and he yells at them. He ends up worshiping idols, and the end of the story is he denied God. And it all started with which one? Do not covet, right? Okay, the end of the part, we'll stop over here. Uh, we have the Shema Yisrael. Ah, no time for that. Okay, so we'll stop here. To be continued. Mr. Shem. Mm-hmm.